So here I'm going to talk about a couple of trade models that I use for international trade class. Generally speaking, I don't use too much intermediate microeconomics. I throw some points in, but for the most part, I keep it simple so that we can focus on the policy applications. So um, you can see here, these are the production possibilities, frontiers. It's important to know these, but well, again, if you take away the major points, particularly involving economics in general, as well as you know what happens to people under different economic policies, that's kind of the point here. So I've already talked elsewhere about the Ricardian model, which is one factor of production and shows how autarky and trade are different. And it shows how people can produce different under autarky. And then with trade, they tend to produce one specific good only. They don't spe they completely specialize. Um, here, I've got the specific factors model, which can be an extension of the Ricardian model. It actually has three factors. And because it has three factors, it has diminishing returns. And that's where the curve comes in on the PPF. Right? Um, one of the goods uses labor and land, and the other uses labor and capital. And that means that one good is mobile. Labor can move between the two uh, industries, but the other good is fixed. It is specific. It can't move. Okay, so uh, each good uses two factors, and because of having um, two factors, we're going to have diminishing returns. You can pour all the labor in the world into a, a farm, but if it's only so big, it, you can't grow more crops. You have diminishing returns. Now, I, I'm going to use agriculture and manufacturing for both of these um, models. Um, just to keep it simple. Um, now, so specific factors is, like I said, has three factors. Heckscher Olin has two factors. Generally speaking, it's labor and capital. And the, what's different isn't the fact that um, each industry uses different factors, right? One uses land, one uses capital. Both of these use labor and capital, but in different mixes. So generally speaking, manufacturing uses relatively more capital per unit of labor. It is capital intensive. Here, I'm going to say agriculture is labor intensive. All right, so uh, it has fewer workers, uh, excuse me, it has more workers per machine, right? So you might have a lot of workers, not very many machines in agriculture, but you might have a lot of um, machines, less workers relatively, All right? So I, I kind of am using the same graphs for both of these to kind of keep it simple, right? But regardless of the model we use, we have the PPF here. Here's the quantity produced of agricultural goods. Here's the quantity produced of manufacturing goods. Right? We've seen this before with different goods for the Ricardian model, only that was a straight line because there was no diminishing returns. Here there is. That's where the curve comes from. Now, under autarky, you're going to have the country producing and consuming point A. Okay? And here is the relative price. Remember, this is the slope, and you can say it's at the tangency point. This is the price that's given up for one good in terms of the other. Now, I say here's exports and imports. Here the M, here's imports, and here it's manufacturers. It might be a little confusing, and I apologize for that. But generally speaking, if the country moves from A to B, they're going to produce more manufacturers. They're going to export that. And at this point, the relative price, rise over run, or what they give up in terms of agriculture to get more manufacturers is the slope here. It's, it's basically rise over run is what they give up of manufacturers, uh, excuse me, what they give up in agriculture to get more manufacturers. Right? So this is the relative price, and that's going to be different at every point on the curve. And that's not the same as under the Ricardian model. That was a constant slope. Here the slope changes as you go. Now, one intermediate micro concept that I don't spend too much time on is this is an ISO utility line. Every point on this curve is a combination of goods that gives you the same utility. And it has to do with trade-offs and diminishing returns as well. If you want more agriculture, you can have more agriculture here. There's a certain point here that where you're giving up manufacturers and getting agricultural goods as a consumer, this gives you the same amount of happiness on this point here and this point here. Um, generally speaking, more happiness can be represented by a curve that's higher up. More goods give you more happiness. Okay, and I'll show you that over here. So that is the uh, standard trade model, okay, where the producer can produce here. Right? And they consume here under autarky because there's no trade. And this point of production is limited by the PPF. And the point of consumption gives you a certain amount of happiness on this utility line. And these all these points cross right through here. This point A is on the PPF. It has a relative price line. And it gives you a certain amount of utility. Okay, And that can be used for specific factors and for Heckscher Olin. Now, down here I go within the country. Okay, now this is specific factors only. Okay, now this is a key economic concept. This, this is kind of like equilibrium and balancing out, oh, and we've seen this with costs and benefits or supply and demand, but this is basically two benefits are equal. And the economic concept is this. 
if an industry, remember manufacturers and, and agriculture, if an industry pays more than the other, you're going to have the pay higher, right? So it's you're basically going to be equalizing two benefits curves. If the country pays more, people are going to move into that industry. If it pays less, people are going to move out of that industry. Okay, so this is the benefit for manufacturers, marginal productivity times the price. This is the dollar value of the production. And remember, workers are paid what they produce. The more a worker produces, in terms of items produced, turned into dollars, so you can multiply by the price, is the benefit in that industry to the worker. It's the wage. It's the, it's the nominal wage. Okay, so for manufacturers, we have diminishing returns, all right? And this is a downward sloping benefits curve. We've seen that before. What makes this different is that we're sharing a labor pool. There's only so many workers. This LM is labor in manufacturers, all right? Or, or in this case, labor in equilibrium, all right? So labor in manufacturers can go this way. Labor in agriculture is going to go this way. We are sharing a labor pool. If we put all our workers in manufacturers, there will be none left in agriculture. If we look at it from the other point, we can start at zero in agriculture and go out. So this is the same falling benefits curve flipped. All right. If you have 100 workers, you can split them between the two somewhere in here. But you could have zero manufacturing workers, which means 100 agriculture workers if you go the other direction. So this is the split. This is our fixed labor pool that has to be shared between the two. And we've seen this curve before. The more you put into manufacturers, the less the benefit is. But if you look at it from this point, the more in manufacturers, the less in agriculture. And if you start from agriculture's point of view, they have the same curve but backwards. Now this is the equilibrium point and the equilibrium wage, okay? Here, workers are gonna move into the industry. If manufacturers pay too much, manufacturers have a higher benefit than agriculture workers are going to move into it so if you start with too few workers in agri in excuse me too few workers in manufacturers then manuf because workers are scarce it's going to pay a lot all right at the same time too many workers that's too many workers in agriculture right and that the economic forces are going to say hey there's too many workers in agriculture pays low there's too few workers in manufacturing, pays high. Workers are going to move into manufacturers and out of agriculture until they reach this equilibrium point. So this is the basic concept of equilibrium, but instead of being costs and benefits, it's two relative benefits, okay? So that is, um, so without trade taking place, I've got autarky here, all right, under the specific factors model, okay? So this is the standard trade model can be used for either all right, and then I focus on specific factors model because I spend a lot of time talking policy and winners and losers from trade, okay? Now, what happens when you open a trade? We've seen this with uh, the Ricardian model, but here you're basically saying that the export price goes up. So the rise, a part of rise over run gets higher and the slope is gonna get steeper and it's gonna, a steeper line can be drawn through point B. And again, this is random, I, I just picked this point, uh, but this matches. At this point, the higher price of exports is gonna encourage, remember, they're going to make more manufacturers. It's going to encourage movement into manufacturers. It's going to encourage movement out of agriculture. It's going to, it's going to encourage movement into that high-paying traded industry and out of the low-paying import industry, right? So they're going to move into exports and out of imports, and now they're going to switch their imports and ex they're going to switch their production mix, right? They're going to go out of agriculture and into manufacture. They're going to produce here. Now, you can imagine that that could hurt farmers, which is kind of the point. Right. So at this point, this, this line is the relative price of the terms of trade that is higher for the export good in relative terms. Now, because of trade, they're going to produce at B, but they're going to consume at C. They're going to consume more than they produce. And that's the whole point of the Ricardian model. People benefit from trade. And now, if you don't know this from intermediate micro, you don't need to know this, but you can assume right more consumption is better than less this point is clearly better if you like more of both goods right but the intermediate micro part is that this is a higher iso utility line so people are happier okay so moving from a to b through trade makes more manufacturer production and then they're going to sell some of the manufacturers and they're going to buy agriculture and they wind up because they're getting so much money on those exports they're going to wind up trading it right? they're going to wind up benefiting from it through that trade all right, now what happens in the specific factors model? Well, the higher price, remember the higher manufactured good price is gonna change this price here. Remember, this is the dollar value of those manufacturers. Well, the higher price means they're worth more dollars. 
and it's going to shift the whole line over. Now look at this equilibrium point. That means that more labor is going to move into manufacturers, which makes sense, right? There's going to be more exports, more production, and there's going to be less labor in agriculture, which we saw above, right? So it's going to change the labor mix, right? The factor mix as in addition to the goods mix. Now one thing about this, if you look at the distance, the wage goes up this thick arrow here, but prices go up a more amount. Okay, now that means that the real wage is might not be up as well. Nominal wages rise, but real wages might go down. It depends. If you are only buying manufacturers, manufacturing prices go up more than your wage does. But if you buy agriculture instead, those prices didn't change and your wage went up. So for, for workers, the real wage impact is ambiguous. You don't know. All right. W over P depends on how what the prices of the stuff you buy is, right? Not wages go up, but prices go up and it could be up more. Right. Now, if you read the Feenster textbook, International Economics, there's much more math on this. But the way I explain the other factors is this. Let's say workers move out of agriculture. All right. They're gone. What happens to those farmers? Well, pr productivity could go down. But if labor leaves, right, think of those farms being empty and those crops can't grow. They're, they're not going to be farmed, right? If, labor's, if labor moves out of agriculture, that means the farm can't produce. The marginal productivity of land can't, is lower, okay? And, and on the other side, what if those workers are moving into factories and those factories add a third shift, they're working full time, the existing machines can produce more because they have more workers to work them. So the marginal productivity of capital could go up. OK, what this is saying is that the payment to land is going to go down and the payment to capital is going to go up under specific factors with this specific mix. Labor is moving into manufacturers and out of agriculture. But the general result is that as this mix of goods is changing, right, manufacturers are producing more, workers are moving more. It's going to help the capitalist, the capital owner, and it's going to hurt the landowner. And this gets into the winners and losers from trade. All right, the workers may or may not be helped. Their wage goes up, but it might not. But definitely the owner of the, that resource that's used in that traded good. Remember, the traded good uses capital. And it is now it has more workers and more production. Those capital owners win. But the, the, the owners of the land, which is producing less and has fewer workers, they're, gonna, they're not going to benefit. All right, so that's where you can see the winners and losers from trade. All right, so it's important to realize that these are some basic economic concepts, right? Balancing forces, equilibrium, payments to factors, payments to goods, and so forth. But here we can show the standard trade model, which can be used for both specific factors and hexer olin And in addition to seeing what's going on in terms of the total quantities produced of each good, we can see what's happening for each factor in that specific factors model.